uh, good afternoon for this session. I don't know which sessions you've already all been in. Uh, did anybody ha go to the previous one on, in this stage? There's always an ass. Yeah, that was fantastic, wasn't it? The, the one on, on homelessness and care. I saw you in there as well. That was fantastic. And then the, the parallel session that was on about, um, about amnesty and rights and pen. That was not quite heartbreaking, actually. Um, amazing stories there. So I, I was just saying to Nazir that you know, part of the point of all of this is that you, who might not know, all know each other. I mean, it'd be strange if you did all know each other. Mm -hmm. um, getting to understand more and more of the, the way that human rights all relate to each other in, in so many ways and how different things intersect. I mean, the, the, the conversation with Dave Tovey about identity and homelessness, how he went from a, being you know, a, a, a poor boy into the military, into be, being thrown out of the military for his sexuality, into a, a life of addiction, into a life on the streets, into a life of, of prison. I mean, all of the connectivity of that and an, an inability of society to put those threads together and understand how to carry somebody through trauma into you know, what he is self-made now as an amazing person with an integrity and a sense of purpose, albeit still plagued by many health issues. So you know, we, we want to all the time, I think, in this festival, make the connections about how the right to dignity and justice, which is the, the basic number one, uh, has to play out in all forms of uh, domestic life, social life, community life, and political life. And this particular session that we're doing today is deliberately called this, you know, a pandemic of male violence. Um, and we, we've really framed it as a, as a health issue. Um, and specifically said a pandemic, a global pandemic of male violence, um, because the scale of male violence, and that's not just against women, but the scale of male violence is so huge, and yet somehow the language doesn't get reflected back into, if you like, the, 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 the pity and worry that one should maybe have about men, as opposed to the very real urgency that we have for the safety of women. Um, there are, obviously, you will have heard probably on the news this morning that there's um, a new set of commitments um, about how we deal with violence to women. But I noticed again that the language was women-centered and women's-led. And for the women in the audience, and there are many, you know, I'm both pleased and not by that situation. Now, we've got some wonderful speakers here, and I've got my two virtual speakers, Gary Barker and Harriet, here. Um, so I'm going to introduce them first, because they're not in the room, but, you know, they're in the room, aren't they, really? Um, so um, uh, uh, Gary Barker is um, uh, the founder of Promundo, which is a, an organisation that is committed to looking at violence perpetrated by men and how one can shift the, the, the understandings and the education and the narratives around that. Um, we've got Harriet Whitridge there, who is considered to be the foremost figure, really, in looking at how we specifically nail down the cases of injustice around violence against women. And she's the sort of the go-to person for understanding both the language and the practicalities of how to get justice. Uh, on my right is, is Nazir Afsal. Um, you will probably maybe have heard of him in a popular context recently. He was on Desert Island Discs, and I, mm -hmm. I was scrutinising your choice, actually, of music and thinking, does this tally? <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was excellent, excellent music. Um, he was the Chief Crown Prosecutor, prosecutor, prosecutor for the northwest of England and formerly the Director in London as well. Um, he was recently the chief executive of the country's police and crime commissioners. He's now in a, in a really interesting capacity advising many organisations, including the Catholic Church, on how to be candid and real about their own histories uh, and, and how they change their practice. And as a result, we will talk about that. More um, offers are coming forward, I think, to try to tackle these same things. Um, um, Mona Arshi is worked as a human rights lawyer at Liberty, specialising in dignity cases. 
before she started writing poetry. And her debut collection, Small Hands, won the Ford Prize for the best collection in 2015. And her second collection, Dear Big Gods, was published in 2019. And Mona is one of the 30 poets that Simon Armitage, our poet laureate, invited to come and speak to each of the rights in the declaration. And those poetic declarations are happening tonight, Saturday and Sunday. In fact, I've just seen Linton Quasi Johnson in the cafe. Um, and uh, they're all gathering, the, the, the poetry royalty of which Mona is one. Um, and then Nimco Ali, uh, who, who have known, I've known for a very long time, the CEO of the Five Foundation. She was named by the Sunday Times as one of Debrett's 500 most influential people in Britain, uh, as one of the Evening Standards 100 most powerful. She has long been a campaigner since really a very young age for issues ar ar around <coughs> FGM and then has moved most recently into advisory positions around violence against women and girls' and women's policies in general. So, you know, we could focus the conversation about girls and women, but I'd really like to start with the idea of men. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Gary. Um, that there, are, If I was to Google women's organizations, women's rights organizations, women, women you know, uh, community organizations, dealing with anything to do with the health and well-being and progress and economic justice for women, there'd be thousands and thousands and thousands of organizations across the world. And in my work, you know, as well, I'm in touch with many of them. If I Google organizations that are trying to tackle attitudes and ideas that are unhealthy for men, there are hardly any, and yours has been going a long time. And it, even though it's an excellent model, it's not got many other examples. And I'm wondering why you think that is and whether that makes you feel downhearted. Um, first, two thanks for, for inviting me. And um, I don't know, there's a, there's a bit of half glass, you know, empty or full. Um, on the, there are a growing number of us, of NGOs, doing this male allyship work, including in the UK. Um, the Beyond Equality Project and many others that we could mention that are um, talking to young men, talking to adult men. But we are not, um, you know, we haven't cracked above the, um, above the fold in the newspaper or, you know, hitting the top line in terms of trending on Facebook or Twitter or anyplace else. Um, one, I think we need to call this what it is, and I think you've started it, which is to say we're talking about men's violence against women and girls and often against other men and boys. I don't think we've figured out a way to help men feel like after the sense of responsibility, after the sense of sometimes that turns into a feeling of guilt um, for men who are not those who perpetrate violence. I don't think we've done nearly enough to say what it is that we want men to do. This moment of Me Too reckoning has been fantastic in the world around calling men out. And I think we've got a huge amount of work to do to say, what is it that we need to call men in? The two thirds of us who don't use different forms of violence against a female partner or harass, et cetera, we're not doing nearly enough to say what it is that we need men to do. Um, and I think part of it, and Jude, you touched on this before, is also to give men space to acknowledge the toxic childhoods and boyhoods that many men have that are one of the key drivers to men's adult use of violence against women and girls um, needs to be discussed. And finding a way that says we all win um, we get to be healthier, um, have better you know, boyhoods, adulthoods, better relationships if we as men also are taught and raised in environments of caring rather than violence. Um, and in calling attention to the, to the childhoods that boys face um, and how much we know that bullying and homophobic bullying and physical violence is part of those, that's not to make an excuse for any man, but it does at least allow us to say we have a common stake as male identified individuals in a world where we hold each other accountable for violence. We use the power of the state to do that. We hold each other accountable in workplaces and at home. Um, and I think we've got a huge, huge social project to say we as men live better too. We've got a stake um, in a world that's free of violence against women and girls. Let me stop there. Well, let me just add one more thing because you founded Promundo in Brazil. And, you know, Brazil has... Uh, some wonderful and vivid aspects of its culture, of course, but it has a very proud machismo culture. You know, you wouldn't think that proud and machismo would be two w words that go well together, but they still do 
in many places. And of course, we currently have Bolsonaro there, who is one of the current like strong men, to take that phrase, um, and if you like, has pushed back very strongly against any idea that attacking men for not being real men is somehow like pr pr profoundly, almost um, irreligious, almost an attacking family values and so on. So that idea of you know the the, lead, the male leaders standing up for not for women, but standing up for a different kind of maleness. Do you see many voices? Because even the, the, the men who are, uh, you, know, um, you know, even Justin Trudeau stands up for women. And uh, I still am waiting for men to stand up for men. Yeah, well, it, it stand up in a positive way, right? Bolsonaro would say he stands up for men and their right to have guns and all the rest. That's not the kind of standing up that we want. Um, you know, our journey in Brazil, our, our work started there. I moved there inspired by the power of the women's rights movement, one of the most, the earliest pioneering ones, powerful ones in the region. Um, and my, you know, the, the work with Brazilian men and women to start Promundo was inspired by that, um, a space that said we can think in a structural way of what we need to get a more just society in terms of the lives of women and girls, and we need men as part of that. So that was the you know, that was the moment we started in Brazil. Um, and we lived a cycle of building that work that ended, well, it didn't end, but um, a recent setback was Bolsonaro kicking out of the public schools in Brazil a healthy masculinity curriculum that we got rolled out across the country and made officially part of the school curriculum. One of his campaign platforms was calling that kit, the educational materials that we developed as part of that, he called that the gay kit and said that we were making men soft and turning them gay. Um, and he used that whole language against what he called the gender ideology. Um, that's been the playbook in the US under Trump. You've seen some aspects of that in the UK. We could look to you know, some aspects of that in parts of South Asia. Certainly, you know, we can name the countries in Europe where similar kinds of pushbacks from the far right have come in there. Um, I think on the one hand, it shows that we've had some success. We are starting to, the feminist, agenda is having some success with all the setbacks. But I think, you know, when right wing politicians feel like they have to call out our material, it means we're making some noise. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure you can talk about that in the, U in the UK context of, um, of just those political battles. So, you know, I don't in, in the, in the, uh, let me put it this way, the pessimism I feel about Brazil at the moment, I also feel quite optimistic of the strength of the women's rights organization that is women's rights organizations that continue to push back on this. And I feel like we'll probably see some political change um, because of advances in the women's rights agenda in Brazil. Um, let me stop there. Okay. Uh, Harriet, I'm going to come to you um, because you're the founder and the director of the Center for Women's Justice. And obviously you've been a civil rights solicitor for over 25 years. You've won lots of, of awards, many, many awards. Um, and I, I, I'm interested in how you think these two things come together, i.e. the journey for women's rights and women's justice and the narrative about men's activism to change the nature of maleness and therefore tackle male violence. You know, do you feel that you have to work like on one side and hope the other one gets on with it? Or is it something where you are, com you know, where you're bringing all genders, all genders together to discuss it? Um, I think part of the problem um, with the, the, part of the whole problem is that women spend far too much time worrying about how they can uh, include men and bring men on board and so on. And, and I, of course, I very much welcome um, these initiatives by, uh, by men's groups that are looking at allyship and looking at... Um, ways in which they can take responsibility for challenging uh, male violence. But I think that, um, you know, uh, women have to focus on um, themselves and not think about how to include men or worry about uh, men other than holding men who are violent and perpetrators of violence uh, accountable. Um, the, the, the purpose of the Centre for Women's Justice is, 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 is really focusing more on the state's role um, and, and looking at, it looks primarily at the criminal justice system. And we have a criminal justice system because we, we need to, to uh, address and tackle 
uh, the public health emergency, which you've, you've rightly uh, um, called this, uh, of uh, male violence uh, perpetrated predominantly against women and girls, but also uh, against uh, men and boys as well. And um, the, the, um, the, the report that you referred to this morning that, that just came out, which, which looks, it's a report into policing, um, it, it, it makes a point that, that many, of the, many of us who've been working in the sector have been making for, for quite some time, which is why do we have, um, uh, you know, we, we, why, why uh, do two women a week uh, get murdered? Uh, why, why, is, why does nothing change? Why do we have all this uh, language and voice uh, around, but there, there is no kind of proper... Uh, attempt to address what is, uh, you know, a public health emergency, which which is a pandemic, and 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 this report does um, highlight the fact that we that the resourcing that went into tackling terrorism, which was seen as a public health, uh, you know, public safety emergency, and the and and even to some extent work that's been done around the county lands issue, shows that if you do um, really focus and tackle on some of these issues, it can make. Um, uh, you know, it can make a significant difference, and 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 you know, we've had report after report after report, but really, the the, the we need action, and uh, and our focus as a as a legal charity is 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 very much in looking at the the laws and the duties that exist, and saying, come on now, these have got to these have got to be enforced because they're not; they've got to be in, implemented because they're not. Yeah, and, and I mean, you, you are hugely to be uh, recognised and congratulated for all the work that you and others have done to move greater policies and greater laws forward that will protect and uh, enhance women's justice. I'm not going to add a but. The fact is that laws can't really work unless society grabs hold of them and insists that they work. And that's obviously not just the police, that's got to be communities as a whole. Um, and so I just want to go back to this idea of, you know, women should get on with looking after women and men, like, get on with the men's stuff. Are, are you really saying that you feel as if, in terms of division of labour, it's more effective for women to continually insist on what their rights should look like and for men, in a way, to sort of pick it up in whatever way they feel? Um, well, I, I, I think the, the, the issue we're dealing with is, is the situation we find us in. And I, I do think women are programmed to worry about men um, all the time. So I'm not saying, uh, you know, men are irrelevant or we shouldn't worry about them. But I, I do think we need to, you know, we need to, to remember, you know, the, where, the, where the key problem is so that the focus should be not on trying to think about how do we include men. We need, we need organisations. We need public public education we need um, you know we need the sort of um, public health campaigns that we've had in the past around things like smoking and drink driving that massively change change the narrative uh, and and that needs to obviously be ro rolled out at the earliest opportunity um, and our focus is is on the criminal justice system which is only a part of the picture mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's our uh, as a as a lawyers that's our speciality and that's where we we focus on and, and, and certainly not to the exclusion of, of other initiatives. Within the criminal justice uh, work that we do, what we see is that unless there is a, a kind of fundamental understanding of the nature of um, the power differentials between men and women in society and the way in which that rolls itself out into uh, violence and abuse and control, unless we actually understand what lies beneath it, we are completely misapplying our resources. Um, and, and so, for example, one area that we work around is the fact that there, there seems to be an inability of, uh, you know, many within the, the police and the Crown Prosecution Service to, to, to distinguish between who are, who are actually victims of crime. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we see kind of a, a very alarming criminalisation of many victims of a crime and uh, you know uh, filling prisons up with the wrong the wrong people um, and, and and I don't I, you know prison is is it should be a last resort and it should that should be there only to contain those that represent a danger but it, far too many 
uh, people who are very troubled and, and, and uh, you know, who are actually victims of violence. If you look at women's prisons, the vast majority of women in prison are victims of abuse and violence. I, the, 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 the announcement this morning, which obviously you were aware of his, before it was announced, is that an example, in your opinion, of the establishments within society taking it seriously and are having a different approach because they are, if you like, finally educated to the realities of this? Well, the, 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 uh, the announcement was, 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 was essentially the publication of a, of, an, of a report that was commissioned following the, um, the murder of Sarah Everard and the public outcry back in March um, of this year in the UK. Um, so the, the, the inspector at the police inspector were asked to go and have a look and see what's wrong with policing. Policing, um, and so they have done an analysis and a report. On, and it's quite powerful. Um, it picks up on a lot of the issues uh, and it makes some very strong recommendations, which will be helpful. But, you know, we have had report after report. We had a couple of months ago uh, the government's end-to-end -end rape review, which was a long-awaited investigation into what the hell is going on with rape, that there are hardly any prosecutions. And, you know, it, again, it makes recommendations, but, we, you know, we've had enough of reports saying what's wrong. We, ha we have to see ways in which that is going to change and be implemented. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so, Nazir... Mm. Um, I had been thinking earlier, what would it be like if we said, okay, here's, here's things that men do to, uh, let's just say, to kittens, you know. Um, they punch them, they kick them, they, they, you know, sexually harass them, they rape the kittens, they tie them up. Uh, they, in, in war, you know, they do multiple torture to them, these kittens. You know, in other words, you described how many, many men like at their attitudes to animals. And you'd say it was barbaric, I think, inevitably. But there's something that is very normalized about the idea that all over the world, not all men, but men in lots of different ways, from teasing through to rape as a weapon of war, uh, will bring their power to bear on to oppress women. Um, and, you know, the, hearing Gary and Harriet talking and with the background of all your work, where do you think that we need to put the conversation in terms of owning the conversation around male violence? Um, I think you use the phrase, not all men a moment ago, and that's often used actually to minimise the, the, uh, the work that happens in this area. Very often the conversations revolve around women's safety. Remember what happened after Sarah Everard Harriet? Uh, the government announced more street lighting. Remember that? Um, where in fact it should be posited around male violence. You know, 50, 90, more than 90% of violence against men is carried out by men. More than 90% of violence against women is carried out by men. More than 90% of violence against children is carried out by men. And you just mentioned pets as well. Um, so that's the problem. And that's the issue, the issue that needs addressing. And I think what was said a moment ago about um, why do we not have these conversations? Mm. Well, it's, it's, it appeared to be a paradox, given that, you know, unlike Beyonce, I don't believe that girls run the world, men run the world. You know, we, we run everything, pretty much, the media, you name it. Why are we then not having these conversations? Mm -hmm. Why at, at the level that we should be having them? And we tend to be very knee-jerk in the immediate aftermath of, of Sarah Everard's murder and, uh, and another one, the Plymouth murders uh, recently, for a week or two. You know, it's the main item on the agenda and then slips off the agenda uh, until the next horrible, terrible, very public murder. But as Harriet pointed out, there have been 100 women killed since Sarah's murder. Mm -hmm. And so it just appears to be a subject that men just don't want to discuss. And I think it touched on a little bit about what you said, Jude, around the difference between a real man and a good man. A real man, you use the word strong, you know, a real man is powerful, controlling, all of those mm -hmm. bullshit ideas. And then a good person is sensitive, empathetic, um, protective, all those kinds of things. And we need to have those conversations about what masculinity means in the 21st century. Look at what's happening in Afghanistan. You know, masculinity is back to men deciding what every, where, where everybody goes and what, everybody, where, what women will go and what women where, et cetera, et cetera, rather than seeing it. Because we have an um, internal conflict. We're, we're, uh, we're beating ourselves up over this, but we're not, there aren't any leaders. And what I look for 
are male leaders saying it's a man's issue? And why do we need to deal with it as a man's issue? Uh, and where do we need to start? Of course, we need to start with young boys. And you know, the em emphasis needs to be on relationship education, uh, on education uh, for young boys to understand what their responsibilities are, what equality really means. Um, but we, we, we're not having those really big conversations. And the, you mentioned this whole talk is around uh, the pandemic and the, the, fight, the idea that this pandemic will outlive uh, the current pandemic. Of course it will. You know, those of us of religion remember how uh, Eve was treated in the Garden of Eden. You know, um, it's, it's the oldest bigotry, misogyny at its heart. And unless we address misogyny mm -hmm. uh, and the hatred of women, then we are just simply playing at it. And, you know, Harriet does phenomenal work uh, in terms of the criminal justice system, and she's absolutely right to highlight the issues she has. But that's the tertiary prevention. You know, if you look at a public health approach, tertiary is the third element, criminal justice. The, 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 or in, in, a, in a health context, it's a chemotherapy. You know? uh, what we should be doing is the primary and the secondary. Primary is tackling the root causes. How much of that do we actually do? You know, I would love to spend, see that £100 million spent on street lighting sent on relationship education in the schools, you know, or given to charities like Gary's and others that exist in order to go and talk to young boys about their rights and responsibilities. Secondary is about early intervention, which doesn't happen. And the, you know, the work that we're doing or the Welsh Government are doing around bystanders uh, and understanding what your responsibility is, all of us. It shouldn't be the victim that has to... Uh, raise, us, raise the spectre of what's happening to her. We all might see something, we need to do something about what we see. But all of that is when harm has happened. We're doing very little about the preventative work mm -hmm. and very little about changing the mindsets that need to change. And I, I, I'm always optimistic and pe pessimistic. Optimistic that we're having this conversation today. Pessimistic that somebody else will be dead today. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it'll be a man that's responsible. What happened, look at what happened after Plymouth. Um, the young man... I'll call him that, killed five people who killed a three-year-old child. And what did we start hearing about? We started hearing about um, incels. We started hearing about um, the fact that he was lonely, uh, the fact that he was not in a relationship, didn't have a girlfriend. What were we doing? We were making excuses. Being lonely doesn't make you a murderer. Be not having a girlfriend doesn't make you a murderer. Being a misogynist makes you a murderer. But we refuse to have that conversation in a sustained way that will enable us to address it. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it comes from the top. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, when law changes, and we've, you know, I've been responsible for some, NIMCO has as well, you, know, you change laws, but you have to change the culture. Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure that people understand what they need to do differently as a result, and it has to come from the top. You know, by, every, by that, I mean everybody in, in politics, everybody in the media, people in positions of power need to realise that I have a responsibility to have this conversation in a sustained way. I mean, Nimco, you know better than I. Has there been a COBRA meeting on violence against women and girls since um, Sarah? I don't know if there has. Um, you know, there was probably one, I think, in the media after. After a knife crime epidemic last year, there was, there was one or two years ago, Theresa May had one. I didn't go. I refused to go. Because I, I feel that, you know, unless you have a sustained approach... You really do take it seriously, as, you, as we've done with COVID, you know, having daily conferences, um, mm -hmm. weekly or monthly COBRA meetings, um, um, as Harriet pointed out, a, a media strategy that's relentless and that reaches the parts that other does, others don't reach, then we are simply tinkering with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where my pessimism comes in, because I don't see that a level of attention to something that requires that level of attention. And it's, you know, let's make it very clear. 51% 50%, of us, are, are, of you, are women, right? It is, you're not a minority, and yet we treat this less than we treat 10, 20, 30 other, other types of, uh, of issues that we should address. This is the issue that we should address. And unless we address it now, we'll have the same conversation in 10, 20 years' time. Our grandchildren will be trying to have this conversation. I'd rather we deal with it now. And that's about addressing it in schools, addressing it with men, challenging male behavior. I've lost, I can't begin to tell you the number of male friends I've lost when I hear them joking or being sexist or whatever it is. I don't want to know you, but I'll challenge them on it first. And we need to be strong enough, the men in this room, to have those conversations on a daily basis. That's how we'll change the culture, not simply hoping that somebody else will do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
the, the, um, the idea of mental health, this morning I did a, a, an exercise about like stand if you or anybody in your family or community experiences mental health issues, everybody stood. And I said, sit if you feel this is something that you wouldn't be able to talk about. Nobody sat. But when we did the same question around violence, sexual violence, many people sat. Because it is still, both for men and women, something that like, can't be talked about. So, you know, you're saying, can we start talking about it now, consistently talk about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I know that you're currently advising the Catholic Church on how they deal with their <laughs> history and their current practice. And one of the things that we are always kind of trying to navigate is how we both kowtow to institutions and at the same time recognise the fact that they are many of the reasons for some of the, you know, institutionalising um, dreadful behaviour. With the credit of the Catholic Church, what they, they, they recognised after um, 2,000 years that there's an issue, <laughs> uh, there's an issue with, when it comes to abuse uh, in the church, um, involving particularly cler clerical abuse. And what they've done... It's actually quite groundbreaking. Three months ago, they set up a brand new agency, which is, I describe it as the Ofsted of the Catholic Church. And I'm its chair, a Muslim in charge. <laughs> of, uh, Excellent. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, the, what we do, and what we've done, and we'll, we'll publish it very, very soon, is we've developed standards for safeguarding, which we will then hold the church to account for on a compliance basis every, every year, the same way that Ofsted probably hopefully better than the way Ofsted managed things. Uh, and that is how you, you have to bring in independence. It's bold, it's brave. Uh, you know, when I spoke to the Cardinal, uh, yeah, I, I told him, you're being bold and you're being brave. Um, and, but what has opened is that since, that since the announcement back in May, I've been approached by other faith groups. Uh, one yesterday from the Jewish community saying, can you help us? Well, you know, I haven't, there's only me. But my point is that people are open to it yeah. once they become aware that there is, uh, there is a way of tackling this. But it, it comes back to the point again that, you know, uh, you know the Catholic Church is, of course, male-dominated. You know, I, I've never worked in an organisation so male-dominated. Um, I have to... I only, do, I only do only do five days a month on it because I, c I can't really cope with being so, around so many men <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for so frequently. Uh, but I am... I understand that they have an appetite for change, mm. and they want to deliver on that. And um, you know, can't let's see where we are in a year or two. But that's the kind of impetus that we need in all our institutions. Yeah. You know, rather than you know hoping again, as I said a moment ago, that somebody else will do it for you. So the the Mona, I mean, you practiced as a, a human rights lawyer for a long time, and you're particularly mm. looking at women fleeing their homes yeah. from domestic violence. Um, and, you know, and there's lots of things we could be covering in this conversation, but just that particular area where you were trying to give support in a very fragile circumstance mm. to women who were needing both to have personal support and legal support and, and a future for them and their kids. How much attention did you feel was being given to the idea of educating both the, the survivor and the perpetrator to a very different kind of framework that perhaps ought to exist. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because we're, we're discussing uh, the legal framework that we have, which is, of course, essential. We have to have those bright lines. And then, of course, you know, Nazir, we're, we're also discussing culture. And actually, just like working in kind of uh, the South Asian community, minority ethnic women, and looking at sort of violence and domestic violence in homes and you can see that the laws are there you know mm -hmm. and um and often a woman or or a, or a young girl will only come to us or, or come to an organization when they're really at the end of that stage but then of course um you're in this kind of other context of the culture which um you know so you have all sorts of issues around reprisals alienation of the victim um, and so uh, having like all those structures to support that are absolutely essential. Otherwise, having a piece of paper which says these are your rights mm -hmm. and trying to convince a young woman or, or a, a mother that's been subjected to years and years of, of terrible violence and been hospitalized through the violence and trying to convince them that the law, the law you, know, is, is, you know, is equipped to deal with your case is, is meaningless. So it has to have, you have to have that backed up by sensitive 
um, structures in the community that can support that. And I think that um, it was interesting when we were talking about um, you know, culture again, about language, because that's something that I'm interested, obviously, in now um, as a writer and, and a poet, because um, recently I went into um, a, a school, six formers, and we were chatting, it was both uh, boys and girls, you know, 16, 17 years, and I said to them, we were talking about patriarchy, and um, I, I said, you know, what's the word for woman hating? And obviously they knew, knew the word misogyny. No one knew the word misandry, because, and we don't know it, because, because it's so normalized. You know, the idea that a, a, a girl or, a, or a, a woman is a victim of sexual violence or abuse is so normalized in our culture. And actually, that's what we see. We, we see a tweet about an, an, a girl or a woman being murdered, and what, we're, what we reduce it to is often the last event of what happened to that, to that person. That's what really, really, I think, that's where we can sort of do something, actually, in terms of, like, trying to say something about the language that is used, the language that is employed. Why is it that we don't hear about the, the, the victim's name? Why don't we hear about what she, what she, you know, she was a mother, she was a student? Why do we only hear the perpetrator's name and the last act, which was, it was a fire, it was an ax. It was this, this fetishization of, of the kind of, the final act, which I find really problematic. The, the idea that this, you know, the, the, the final moment is the convincing moment which says, oh yes, violence happened, look, she's dead, mm. um, is, uh, again, it, it, it's, it somehow manages to compress the problem into the act of that perpetrator, as opposed to it being part of you know, a society where that might be the most extreme version, but, but versions of it are happening all the time in different ways. And I want to go back to your point about the community that you mm. were particularly involved in. And Nazir, that we've talked about this before as well, which is that there's, I mean, obviously different religious communities, whether they be the Catholic Church or the Taliban, you know, they, they, they all have views on women. They've all kind of legislated spiritually for women, where women's rights should sit. And it, it seems to me, as you know, a non-practicing person, um, that I still am subject to that idea. You know, I am subject to the idea that women's creativity can't really be there, not fully, because God created Adam, you know, and went zzz. And, you know, I am subject to the kind of the fallout of all theologies, whether I believe or not believe. Um, and do you think that by like honing in on particularly misogynist places like the Taliban at the moment, mm. we like let off the hook, the, the trail that leads there, that everybody's practicing on one level or other, just by allowing women to remain unequal? Do you think it's, you know, do you, do you think it's, we, we sort of blame different bits of the community because we can see it in, in more detail. I think we don't historicize enough. And, and if we, I think maybe partly it's to do with the fact that we live in a, in a culture now where we are scrolling and we are sort of, um, so it's a very kind of events-based today. But we have to historicize patriarch and we have to historicize systems, systems that have existed for centuries that have done this to women. And actually, um, it's interesting because we, in the work that I've done with, 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 with in South Asian communities, for example, what I found very interesting was that it is, the, it is of course, the men that are perpetrating this violence, but because the cult, the, the, what you're often dealing with is, is a culture that is steeped in those traditions and those, those um, systems, actually, that put me, women, men in these power, often women, the women are also complicit with it. So that is another complication that we, you know, that... that complicates some of, the, some of the issues around violence against women. Yes, and I think this is a very important thing because often people kind of go, well, these women have agreed to it as if, as if women giving away their human rights equals, well, that's okay then because women have chosen not to have those rights and because they're women, then it somehow that makes it okay. And, and so we, we often are using women's voices to justify the idea that these rights don't really have to exist, you know, like Trump's women, as it were, you know, the fact that they would, would all stand by their men meant that we didn't really need feminism in Texas, I mean, and so on. Um, 
But where do you stand in this idea that, of course, we're trying to give women the language of their rights, our rights, but we're trying to give men the language of their rights and their different rights than perhaps the ones that we've been telling them for 2,000 years? So how do we convince men that... Um, patriarchy is actually really bad for them as well. Yeah, that they're ill. So, I mean, I think that that is, that's the, that's, I think, the, the biggest challenge. And how do you do that? And I think you have to, I agree with Nazir, you have to, you have to start young, you have to go into to, to schools. You, there has to be uh, a real kind of political and societal will to be able to engage in those conversations. And I think that's starting to happen, actually. Um, there needs to be a real kind of rethink about the fact that we have to accept that there is, we live in this culture which is violent towards women and women are endangered. When we walk down the streets, we're endangered. It's a totally different... I mean, I have, two do I have um, twin daughters who are 17 and I'm ha having the same conversations with them um, that you know, like my mother had to have with me. Yeah. You know, I have to talk to them about what they wear outside, you know? Um, I have to talk to them about things like now upskirting. I have to, you know, all these kind of ideas that I thought were kind of, you know, prehistoric from the 1980s and 90s. They're not going away and in any way. I actually, in a, I kind of think that the attitudes towards women in public spaces is actually worsening in some respects. Yeah. Well, as Nazir says, unless men are going to talk about it and boys are going to talk about it, then we women can carry on talking about it for a long time because we're already minority voices, even if we're not minority in terms of numbers. So obviously we'll be left to our hearts content to talk. Um, doesn't mean anybody has to do anything. I'm looking at you now, Nimco, because you said to me earlier that you had really tried to push forward the idea inside uh, the, the, the government that actually wolf whistling you know, was something that could really be thought of as terrible male behaviour, very um, harassing and troubling, uh, but you kind of got pushback from number 10. That, they, that it would Almost I kind of thought you were saying, well, they want to think boys will be boys, and that it's not really that serious. So I'm interested in where you, working now as you are at, at, within government, are finding the division between men in government owning the responsibility, as opposed to the women in government trying to push forward legislation. Do you know what? It's been, um, it's been really interesting in the fact that some of the most um, powerful things I've heard in terms of those that want to be able to end violence against women and girls has come from men, from the Prime Minister to the former Justice Secretary. And there was a COBRA-style um, meeting um, just, at the, like, you know, just after Sarah Everett's um, um, d uh, murder. And what was interesting was the fact that one woman in a position of power, she wasn't in government, but she was in a position of power, was the one that was undermining actually the, the public reaction. So in December last year, we launched the, the Violence Against Women and Girls strategy, well, the consultation for the strategy. And even that, we, so when, when it closed, after eight weeks, we had about 10,000 submissions, um, interestingly enough. And then um, literally it closed just after Sarah, Sarah Everett's, just a week before Sarah Everett's death, it, um, it closed. And we reopened it. And we had the 150,000 people, mostly women and girls, to write in and actually tell us about their experiences. So there is a massive commitment throughout government in order to be able to tackle violence against women and girls, but also from a position of actually, we can't legislate our way out of this, we have to have a social norm, we have to have conversations. But yeah, ultimately, I, was, um, I really do want, and I really do think that we do need a public sexual harassment um, piece of legislation. It's the fact that if men cannot act in a certain way in a private home or in a public space, such as like, you know, bars, clubs, um, offices, then why are they allowed to act like that on the streets of our country? And the, and the streets of our country have to be spaces where women feel safe, and, that's, and, 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 and we don't feel safe. And I know... Um, 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 Nazir was a bit cynical about the um, about the street lights and things that were going in, but the whole thing is that there are going to be a myriad of um, things that the government's going to roll out, but there was just a system there that we can actually put that money in. But yeah, so we wanted to make public sexual harassment um, a crime, and I really put my um, kind of political um, kind of capital into that conversation. But what came back, and it's really interesting, the way that the media also um, twisted it was the fact that we were just talking about mere wolf whistling. The, so there's a campaign called Our Streets Now, and, and, and the things those young women talk about are horrific. So the whole point is that you get fined for dropping litter on the streets of this country, but you can say aggressively disgusting things to young women and nobody does anything. So that was the whole thing, is that we have to be able to 
men need to be embarrassed. That's literally what I'm saying. It's like people are more embarrassed about drug and litter than that, and they are to tell a young 12-year-old um, girl in a school uniform to come over here and perform a sexually ex ex um, um, explicit act. So yeah, I, like, you know, I wasn't about legislating against wolf whistling, but at the same time, men don't have the right to, like, you know, to comment on women's appearances on a daily basis. On, on, on a daily basis. And the idea of opening up these conversations with you know, with men and boys at all levels of society and then insisting on them over and over again in the way that we have really been insisting on conversations about mental health. And I would say this is almost like, if we just put it in a mental health context for a minute, you know, that this is a level of, of violence and prurience and sort of sexual and powerful entitlement that is really unhealthy. It, it's massively unhealthy. And what I found interesting is the fact that men in power specifically do, do not see the correlation between the man that wolf whistles to the man that rapes. So, so there's a massive focus on rape and um, domestic violence, rightly so. But ultimately, we, we, we also have to be talking about the low level um, migrate, like you know, the low level crimes that are happening, which lead to the position where women feel unsafe, unable to report, and also men feel like they have a duty, or not, well, they have the right to be able to. Um, talk about uh, well, talk at women the way that they do, and I, and 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 I remember after Sarah Everett's uh, murder, I tweeted men. I didn't, and this is the whole thing. And then, and then basically, what was um, trending above Sarah Everett was not all men. I was like nobody. So I was on a radio station, and um, this guy said to me like, you know, so what are you saying that all men are rapists? And I was like, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I haven't got the time in a dark alleyway to pick up whether you're my friend or you're not. I think it was Muhammad Ali that said, like, you know, if, if a hundred pythons are going to come at you, you haven't got the time to see which one is not poisonous, in that kind of sense. So there is, like, you know, it's a corrosion of our day-to-day -day experience that we live in fear. And I think that, for me, the work that the government needs to do and the work that I'm hoping the government will do, it's not just end violence against women and girls, but end the fear of violence against women and girls. I think that is what the mental health issue is, that women in this country are scared on a day-to-day -day basis, and you shouldn't be living in that kind of context. Okay, so end of fear of violence for girls and women, great. I want to whip it back round again, though, and say that owning the ability to create that fear and violence and, and why you would do it and it is a really key thing that we're not having those conversations with boys and men about yet. And, and I mean, that's why I'm, keen, I'm insisting not... over and over again that we try to turn the conversation away from, we're all doing the work, the women are doing the work, but you know, we're not getting men to do the work yet. I'm gonna open it up to the audience. And um, there's some men in the audience. Yes, and there's a man, thank you. Do you want to put, uh, um, take that microphone? Thanks. <coughs> Maybe I should start with a confession. <laughs> in, in the name of boys' banter, I too have been guilty of misogyny through so much of my life. And today I see the correlation between that misogyny and things that happen <coughs> and, and where they go in, in, in relating to, to the refreshing discussion that's taking place. Um, and we just discussed legislation. How do we see um, misogyny being made a hate crime? seen as the confession that I've just made as well, in terms of helping create that situation which might actually challenge, do the challenging that Nimco and others have spoken about. Also, I fear um, th the response to this is multi-pronged. It's, it's cultural, it's theological. Th there's so many elements to this because there's a particular culture that I spend my time with when I'm just around my Indian boy mates. And today, again, I see the correlation of what happens in India, where, for example, Marital rape is n not a crime, and it happens constantly. And there's a growing, increasing violence in India at the moment uh, to towards women. It, it's almost like a comeback because you know, I, in India, I've seen some very strong women's organisations and very strong women, in, including in my family as well. So, how do we kind of challenge that if our approaches are limited or or, or one you know one track? How do we do several approaches? How do we all come together on this same thing without kind of calling each other out depending on which identity we're concentrating on at uh, any one given time. Mm. Thank I you. Th I think you've covered a huge amount really helpfully there. First of all, thank you for saying, you know, I have misogyny in my background. It's almost impossible for people not to. Um, in the way that Black Lives Matter called out white entitlement 
and said, don't pretend you're not a racist if you were brought up in a neo-colonial organization like a country and you're white. You know, it's not, it, where were you then? Um, and so I don't think it has to be a blame game, but it has to be a change game. And this, the issue of if we make misogyny a hate crime, how will that help? Can you take any other questions? Um, pass the microphone to somebody else, just pass it on. Hi. Um, I, I don't want to take my mask off. Just speak louder, that's all. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wondered, when you talked about making legislation about street harassment, um, do you see the power in that as being signalling that it's wrong? Cause, because, for example, I run a lot and I have, particularly throughout the pandemic, experienced quite a lot of quite violent comments while I run, but I wouldn't I wouldn't stop to find out who that was or take record of who did it. And at times I felt very powerless because I thought even if I did report some of this violence, there would be no nothing that could be done about it because I don't have information about the perpetrator and it's not safe to find that out. And so I wondered if it's the um, kind of yeah, the signalling effect of legislation that you think is so useful um, in that context. Thank, thank you. OK. Anybody else? Somebody here? Do you want to pass it over? Yeah, I just wonder um, how it's possible to do anything um, against the backdrop of pornography mm. being so readily available. And I heard this week that children as young as seven are coming across it. I think that is a big factor. Okay, and I think just take one more question. I think there's people at the back there. There's a the man at the very back. And, and let's, let's take those two questions then. You and then the man at the back. Thanks. Uh, mine was just following on from what you've just said in terms of going back again to Nazir and Nimco, like the starting at the education and empowering the young girls. So I have an eight-year-old daughter and I'm really focused on kind of empowering her to call out anything that she thinks isn't right. So it's kind of moving that conversation as well. I also have a five-year-old son. So I'm trying to educate him so it's kind of how we have those discussions at government and normalise those conversations with the really young children. Thanks. I'll try and keep it brief, but I just wanted to briefly bring something slightly different into the conversation. I'm just going to speak really briefly from a <coughs> male, white, but gay perspective. Mm -hmm. I think as gay people, we get very, very good at a very young age at studying and understanding how, stra how straight people uh, act because we live in a straight world. Much in the way that maybe the people of colour can identify living in a white world. You know, you understand how white people are, but you're not white. The problem I find for myself as a gay man and a white male is what is my role in the march towards gender equality? Because the conversation about the way that men and women interact in public, I feel completely outside of. I, re I interact with women in a fundamentally different way but I interact with other men in a more unique way. So my question for the panel, if you would like to answer it and if you have any suggestions is, is there a role that gay and queer people can play, a unique role, maybe in terms of the conversations that I have as a homosexual man with my heterosexual male friends that can actually bring us you know, where we need to get? Is, is there something that I can do or that gay people can do to, to help with this? Because I don't know what my role is. Okay, thank you. And thanks for being so open about that as well. Um, Gary, can I come back to you? There's a lot there. Um, I, I don't know which you want to want perhaps pick up on. Uh, uh, we've, we've talked about, you know, what's the role of gay men in being allies in a different way and how do we deal with the kind of rise of prolific pornography? Um, and if we make hate crime a, a crime, well, hate crime is a crime, I mean, does that deal with misogyny? You know, does that actually achieve what it says on the tin? Yeah, I think I may come back to um, combining those three questions and come back to something Nazir said that that struck me. And I and then I think all of us, you know, should keep in mind is that we've got a great prevention science of what works. The framing of this, Jude, as you did at the beginning, as a health pandemic, we have there is a there is a science, and I think to be um, it, it is easy with the size of the problem to say we don't know what to do. Um, the UK government, in fact, through UK aid, has funded for years an initiative called What Works that's been supporting work in the Global South to build an evidence base of what works to end violence against women. And there's other places as well. 
that list, and you know, I, I don't want to spend too long on it, but the kind of prevention education in schools and after school programming, trauma approaches for those who have witnessed or experienced violence at school, at, uh, at home, parent training programs that reduce harmful child rearing, um, combined with good perpetrator intervention programs, combined with workplace programs and other um, harassment prevention efforts, including bystander approaches. Those plus the legal apparatus that Harriet talked about before working to its fullest extent, when we do those things together, we can actually make a difference in reducing the incidence at the population level. The issue is there's probably half a dozen places on the planet where policymakers have actually ever put those in place. And so I, I think what I'd, what I'd like to emphasize in, the, in, these, in these different threads of the conversation is to say we can prevent this if we have the political will. And I suppose the you know, key part that I see men needing to be part of, not only what do they do to call it out in their daily lived spaces, but to hold politicians and policymakers accountable to, if we believe we can prevent this, we've got to put the resources and the political will behind it. Um, and I think exactly that's the, that is the message that I want men voting together with women <laughs> to hold policymakers accountable to say we can end this. Um, we've got we've got lessons learned of what works. We need to take it to scale. It is a question ultimately of political will that will, of course, drive the cultural change that we want to do. Very specifically, the comment on what can gay men do on this. I mean, I think homophobia and transphobia are clearly pillars of patriarchy. They're what we do to you know to to build and rebuild cycles of violence every day. Um, and I think these issues must come together. The homophobic violence that happens in the lives of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and other individuals every day needs to be part of this equation as well. And just one final point, and Jude, I like the point that you've made of saying, um, I do think this has to be together. If we roll out at a large enough scale all those approaches that I talked about, men's lives get better too. We live better, healthier, safer lives as men. And I think finding a way that is talking about the sum of us rather than dividing um, I really think is, is the political way forward to say, men, we have a stake in this. Um, a life, a world where women and girls are free from violence, we have a stake and a duty in it. Thank you, Gary. Um, Harriet, of the different things that you've heard in the conversation, what do you think that we should think of focusing on most strongly in order to make another step forward? Um, I... I had a slight difficulty hearing some of the questions, but um, from your summary, um, the um, themes that uh, you picked up on were misogyny as a hate crime, uh, what gay men can do, and also the the the, the, the narrative, the pornographic narrative, which yeah. I think is absolutely terrifying. Actually, um, the, the the level of violence, the way in, li in which it legitimises. Um, increasingly horrendous uh, violence and, and, and sort of tries to condition us to accept that this is somehow normal. And it's quite interesting if you look at that question next to, uh, to, the, to the one about sexuality. And I think that, that uh, a, a lot of the sort of false narrative of male-female relationships also comes from a, a sort of a traditional sort of heterosexual uh, romantic uh, um, narrative, if you like, the you know the the, the kind of very basic um, kind of story that we're you know so, sort of story that we're told and 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 what we expect in terms of um, you know a, a male female relationships and and certainly um, you know being able to to challenge um, heterosexual norms is 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 in itself uh, a potentially revolutionary act. Um, uh, you know, for, for, for both lesbians and gay men um, and to challenge um, those traditional sort of relationships. Um, that, that's just a sort of observation underlying it. In terms of the hate crime issue, I, I th uh, the, my concerns about it, I, I think it has a, a, a normative value to, to name misogyny and to, uh, and to call it out. But uh, I, I, th I think we have to be a bit careful about increasingly criminalising types of speech uh, when we are not effectively enforcing the law in terms of actual violence and control and abuse and sexual violence and that, that there is such a huge um, job to do in relation to that that to then sort of start looking at 
what he said and, and the sort of policing of the Twitter sphere, et cetera, et cetera, um, is, is, is not necessarily what the criminal justice system should focus on um, when, when, when it is so woefully failing in terms of actual physical crimes that are being committed. There is a, a, a possibility, isn't it, that we all play a part by creating zero tolerance in every way that we can. The criminal justice does what it, it does, civil society does what it does. Nimco, I, I'd just like to find out from you whether the government who are, you know, they, they referred to terrorism this morning in the kind of report from the police that said they should be treated as seriously as terrorism. Mm. And there's just the beginning of the idea that the manosphere is so dangerous um, for men as well as women, because it's an attracting, radicalising movement. Do you think, I mean, mostly the government is still male and male-led. Do they feel that this is something that they are prepared to stand up and be counted on? No, they really do. And um, like I was saying, at that meeting that I was at, I didn't, I didn't say much, and I got a text message from one of the ministers saying, do you want to add um, to the other conversation? But it was, there was a lot being said by people I wouldn't actually expect um, to be taking the leadership. So I think there is that commitment. I just wanted to kind of come back on the um, on the public sexual harassment piece of legislation. We do need the legislation in order for us to set the template, just like the smoking ban and the seat belts and drink driving, in order for social norms to change and for society to actually see something as a crime, it has to be stated in a legislative um, um, context. And then I think that also comes back into the porn um, um, kind of um, context. There, there were 500,000 um, young women that were contacted through the education department recently through um, the Children Commissioner. And it's really interesting that there is a, um, um, an online harms white paper that's going through Parliament at the moment. And at the Home Office and where we're sitting, we are looking at revenge porn, we're looking at um, por um, child pornography, but when it comes to actual pornography, the reality is that we're giving so much space and so much consumer power, or, or so, so, so much power to the, tech, um, to the tech companies. So I think that's the conversation that, that, that we need to be having as citizens and also as consumers, is actually holding the Googles, the Twitters, and the, um, and the Facebook's accountable. And Twitter is very interesting. There's a, there's a, um, a young man who's been, um, produce, actually, he's technically on release at the moment for sharing revenge porn. So this is the kind of caliber of person he is. But he's creating aggressive, horrific porn on Twitter. And Twitter will not take it down. But then what they also do is, like, when everybody reacts to it, his name trends. And because Twitter is set in such an open space, a child could just tag that name and it will be taken straight into um, this kind yeah. of... So I think what we as citizens and we as voters can do right now is actually contact um, um, the government and actually look at the online harms paper and say that that, that that tech companies should not be given the power in order to legislate um, for what they put on their platforms because at the moment that is what's happening. We can deal with criminality, terrorism, p um, child porn, or um, but we can't deal with the ones that are actually really corroding our society. So I do think that there is commitment but we can't make anything happen without the public actually supporting us. And the tech companies are incredibly powerful as they stand at the moment. So, uh, we're going to end with um, Mona, who's written a poem. And what, you'll be reading the poem on Saturday night, is that right? Which, which night are you reading as, as part of the declaration? Uh, this evening, actually. This evening, yeah. okay. Um, you chose Article 3, 4, and 5. Uh, as the inspiration for this poem. Do you want to just explain why? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I'm really interested and have always been interested in, in all my work, actually, including my, my work as a poet, in being really aligned to social justice and particularly for women and sort of trying to write into the kind of deficit that where women are often silenced. And the Yazidi women situation is something that I've been following for the last few years and I just I saw a recent article about some of the women and um, how um, a lot of them were being shamed and and how a lot of the kind of history had been rewritten and there was something about having a poem that sort of puts a stake in the ground and sort of has a, a witnessing of, of, a, of an atrocity like that that's why I wrote the poem thank you do you want to thank you This poem is for the Yazidi women. Mute Mountains. In the skies over Mosul, 
The poem twitches into being. It flickers its orange tail. Flames, echoes in the valleys. The valleys will absorb the after sound. Here are the compound eyes in the heads of the poppies. Here is a girl who refuses to look into the wind. Now she is bone breath and ashes. This is where the poem begins. The fringes of this poem dare to lie back across the dust in straight lines. What can a poem do, Suyaman, when it meets the so what bird of the mountains, that bird that will only drink water on the wing? This poem has such tender hooves, but it cannot follow you into the tent, into the pockets of men. It cannot touch your hair because it rests now on its receiver. Perhaps you will remember the stories, those women who stream past, holding beads and ancient skillets, their wise mouths uncovered. In the thirst-filled days, they refused groundwater. They whisper to us, like ephemeral sisters, through the unerasable mountains. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. We, we, we've slightly run over, which means that if you're going to go and get a cup of tea and come back for the conversation on Afghanistan, then um, I haven't given you much time to do it. I'm sorry. But um, there are worse things that could happen in life. Um, I'd just like to thank the panel virtually and really for being here. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and, you know, to join these conversations together across all genders, I think, is a really critical thing. Everybody has to do their bit. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.